good to have you back again. <laughs> we were talking with Herb a little bit before the break, and we were sharing a little bit about the history from, from whence we came. And, and I, I guess one thing that comes to mind right now is if nobody really captured the history or talked about, like Herb talked right, about right. in books, the, the election of Barack Obama might not be as significant in the hearts and minds of people of knowing from whence we come. The other thing that's happening now, because I'm in the process of doing a lot of programming, cultural programming in the schools, mm -hmm. and I'm bringing people like Herb Boyd, Delani Davis, um, Tanya Bolden, Donald Bogle. These are all prominent African-American authors who go to schools, talk to the students about their books and about the history of blacks in America. And today we were up in Pecanico Hills, which is on the Rockefeller estate. Mm -hmm. So we had a wonderful experience up there with Tanya Bolden, mm -hmm. who is another prominent author. And the students are curious. They want to know about the history, in particular because now we have an African-American president. So I think this is an opportunity for us to not only talk about our history, but correct the record. Heard, let's mm -hmm. talk about how do we access some of this history because Whoa. we don't necessarily get it in the school system. Mm -hmm. So we've got to find someplace else in order to get it, which has been a challenge for many of our people too because uh, if they're not getting it through the school system, mm -hmm. really taking that next step and going to get it, we're not really so proactive in doing. But how for those people who have that desire, mm -hmm. what do they do? But it's three ways that we're educated in society. It starts with the family, right in the home. You hope you can get a head start, a leg up right there with your parents, with your siblings. The next thing is your peer group out there in the street. And then you look to the educational system and, and the media, which are, are connected up. Uh, so if you are not getting it home and you fail to get it with your peer group, and you cannot get it from the educational system, you almost have to be a kind of like a, 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 a self-taught individual. Mm -hmm. You know, where are you gonna get this information? You find it out there with role models. For me, you know, when I was growing up, I had a fairly decent high school education, but it really didn't kick in until I got involved in the movement. And I was around a lot of other, other young people who were also curious about what was happening to us, you know, how can we make a difference? And by 1966, 67, when things just exploded, exploded. around mm -hmm. here, yes. then it made it very easy for us to kind of assume an activist role out there. And I think we began to educate ourselves because we didn't read Du Bois, we didn't read about Paul Robeson, we didn't read about, you know, Malcolm X, but because we had movements out there, we came in touch with other folks who began to educate us and we exchanged and shared information. But mm -hmm. I think the other part, place that many African Americans uh, learn about African American history are the churches. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, which was also called the Freedom Church, the church of Harriet Tub Tubman and um, Douglas. Sure, Paul Robeson too. And Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. so, Jermaine Wesley Logan. <laughs> right? So a lot of history is steeped in the African American churches. And growing up in Nurse um, a lot of the things that we learned about about history we learned in church. So it's not that students are going to church so much nowadays, but it's still an important um, place that- For history. Right, mm -hmm. it is. And it's one that we should nurture and one that we should promote. Mm -hmm. right, we were talking a little bit earlier, and I heard you say, you, you used the word, movement. Yes. We talked about the 60s and what kind of <laughs> movement that is. But you have to admit, what Barack Obama was able to uh, come away with this time mm -hmm. and the way that he was able to galvanize people, you would have to characterize that as a movement yes, as well. absolutely. Yes, and mm -hmm. again, I think what you said about the technology, I mean, the way that I got to work on the Barack Obama campaign was I did it virtually. <laughs> I mean, so I signed up online, you know, I called people in the uh, battleground states and documented their responses, and then right after you finished talking to them, you submitted the data to you know Barack Obama's mainframe, wherever that was, mm -hmm. and they were able to do you know data recovery in real time. Mm -hmm. So they knew exactly where he stood on any given day, as far as votes were concerned, and what people's opinions of 
Let me let me use some technology myself here on this show. We want to go to the phone lines now. We want to bring you in to come and share with a little bit of our conversation here and share your perspective. Obviously, you've been hearing a lot of what's been going on with the show. We want to open up the phone lines, and we know that we've got George on the line. George. Hello. How are you, George? How you doing? Come on. Uh, good to have you. Thanks for thanks a lot and your question tonight. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was I wanted to ask um basically um how can we as, as a community. Um, collectively get the school systems to, to focus more on black history as a whole, I mean, throughout the year, not just only in February, but like just throughout the year across the board, focus mm. on black history. Excellent question. I got the right people here to answer it. Mm. Stay right there. Brilliant. I think that it's really <laughs> interesting because New York State has established a commission called the Amistad Commission. It hasn't done much, but basically what they're charged with is including African-American history in the curriculum for K through 12. I have a new book coming out in 2010 called Discovering Black America. It's for middle school children. Mm -hmm. And this is an important aspect of our history because it's an opportunity for it to be inclusive. It's not just like one event. It's, we've, we've been here since the early 1600s and beyond, actually, before that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've done some incredible things. I mean, from the beginning, I mean, you had Estevanico, who was exploring the... Mm -hmm. um, Estevanico. Right, mm -hmm. who was exploring the South, mm -hmm. you know, the, um, from Florida to New Mexico. Then you had the folks that came over in Jamestown, mm -hmm. the Africans who were not initially slaves. They were um, basically, they became free after a while. And so you have this, this, this black society that grew prior to slavery, and people don't really understand that, and people don't have that information. But with uh, the Amistad Commission, New Jersey has it, and they're fully functioning. So their schools integrate African-American history every day mm -hmm. from K through 12 and it's part of their curriculum. Okay. And, that's, and that's what we need to do in New York. Thanks, George. And we want to thank you for calling in. We want to tell our viewers, you can also, if you have another phone call, come on and call us, and uh, we'll get you right in there. I'm just saying that Philadelphia, for example, they are in their school system, and black history is required before you graduate. Right. Yes. You know, so that kind of institutionalization of it, getting it into the curriculum, that's part of the whole struggle for black studies in this country. Again, it grew out of the movement of the right. 1960s. The 60s. Mm. <laughs> Do you think that we're going to see more of that now? Are we going to see that integration, especially with Obama being the president? Because, I mean, they've got some, I mean, there's so much hope that is attached to Barack Obama, no pun intended, sure. right. but yet and still, we know that he's not going to be able to fix the economy, fix this, yeah, fix that, no. do everything that we need him to do, because He's only got max eight years. <laughs> Come on, let's be real here. Uh, what, what are we going to do? Well, the expectations are sky high. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and rightfully so, because, you know, after so many uh, 400 years of very dismal, you know, this kind of dark days, you know, finally we see some light. And, and I think we're putting a lot on him. It's a lot of pressure given all of the, I mean, the one time we can take over the government is the worst time. Right. <laughs> the worst time. But, you, you, but I think he's good. You know, he, he's going to turn this into a very positive situation. It's already beginning right. to show some signs out mm. there. And mm. what I like about his attitude is he's not saying that he's going to do it alone. Mm -hmm. He's asking everybody to help. Sure. And I think that's, you know, the most important thing. I think that, you know, politicizing the individual and making people interested and what's going on in the government and making government transparent so people really understand who's doing what and where the money's going. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are all issues that he's going to, you know, mm -hmm. cover. 